So here in 14.6 and 14.7, we are now going to take a look at how we can test how well uh, these antimicrobials work, or if they work at all. Uh, we do that through antimicrobial susceptibility tests, or ASTs. What we can do is we can test the effectiveness of antimicrobials against a specific organism. Mm -hmm. um, this gives us or identifies a spectrum of activity. Um, and then this is how we can get our therapeutic dosage. So if we can see if um, a particular organism is going to be susceptible, meaning that it will be killed off by an antimicrobial, or if it's resistant to it, meaning that it has some sort of resistance to fight against it and therefore is not killed off, then we can determine, or if it's intermediate, you know, if there's some particular level in, the, in between to where it can kill it off if we give a high enough dosage, then we can determine our therapeutic dosages for these things. So we need to figure out um, some standards, what can and can't um, kill off what and at what level, uh, and then that's how we can apply our, our therapeutic dosage levels. And then that's also how we can test uh, a particular person's sample and see what it is or isn't resistant to given their particular infection. Uh, we can do this in a variety of ways. Some examples, and we're going to look at them in more detail, are the Kirby-Bauer disc diffusion test and then dilution tests. <clears throat> So our starting point for determining susceptibility of a specific microbe is to a particular antimicrobial is typically the Kirby-Bauer test, uh, the, the disc diffusion test. And this is because it's a very, very simple test to do and it works very quickly and it gives us a starting point. So we use Mueller-Hinton agar on this and the reason for that is because uh, Mueller-Hinton is not as thick as our typical LB agar or um, um, a lot of other standard agars. So it allows for things to diffuse through it more easily. And this is important when we're talking about taking a particular antimicrobial, placing it on agar, we want it to be able to diffuse to see if it's actually reaching these bacteria and what it's doing. So we uh, take the Mueller-Hinton plate, we inoculate it uh, with the bacterial lawn, so from the patient's isolated bacterial pathogen. So we find the pathogen in a person's sample, we've isolated it, and then we've grown that up and we take a sample of that and we swab the entire plate um, with that particular bacteria, not for isolation, just the entire plate to get a bacterial lawn. Now, we don't grow it up to actually see the bacterial lawn, but what we do is we completely inoculate the plate. Then we take filter paper discs um, and we either can buy them um, already impregnated with the antimicrobial, or you can impregnate it yourself if you have um, antimicrobial in a liquid form, for example, you can soak the disc. Um, however, they're typically purchased with standard amounts. So we have the filter paper discs with standard amounts of the antibacterial drugs, and then we place them on the agar plate. Um, take those, flip them upside down, put them in an incubator, and allow them to grow. So we grow our bacterial lawn. <clears throat> we see that the antibiotic is going to diffuse from that disc and into the agar. And then we can see what's called the zone of inhibition. So the zone of inhibition is a clear circular region that's around the disc. And the diameter of the zone, not the radius, so if we're talking about here's, let's say this is our disc here, and this is all bacteria growth out here, um, but there's no growth in this area here. That's where my no growth area is. That would be our zone of inhibition. This here is the zone of inhibition. This out here is all bacterial growth. And we'll see a picture of this in just a moment. Uh, this right here is the disc. <clears throat> our diameter of the zone, so from one end of the circle to the other end of the circle, straight through the disc is the diameter. That's going to be measured in millimeters. And then we can compare that to a standardized chart. And then this will determine whether or not this person's bacteria is susceptible to that antimicrobial, meaning it kills it, um, or whether it's resistant to it, meaning it's not doing anything for it, or another one is intermediate, if it's intermediate. Um, and there are varying levels of intermediates. So some considerations with this, these are the images here. Uh, so this of course is an illustration of that with the discs and different zones of inhibition you can see. Uh, these are real images uh, with the bacterial lawn. And you can see here that for example, whatever these are, here it looks like it's on uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. 
Pseudomonas, this particular strain of Pseudomonas aeruginosa happens to be um, resistant to whatever is on these three discs here, so whatever antimicrobials are there. However, there is some sort of susceptibility uh, to whatever's on this disc, and you can see that the ruler is here measuring the millimeters, measuring the diameter to find out if it is intermediate or if it is resistant. And you can see the same thing over here with Staphylococcus aureus. You can see varying levels of resistance. And again, going directly through the disc, measuring from one side to the other. Some considerations are drug solubility. Um, so some antimicrobials might be larger chemicals, so they're not going to diffuse as easily. Um, so that could change the way it is, which is why there are standards. Um, but that's a consideration. Um, also the rate of diffusion through the agar. So again, drug solubility, meaning does it go into the agar? And then what's the rate of diffusion in the agar? The thickness of the agar. Um, so in the actual plate itself, and then the drug concentration in the disc. So typically they're purchased with a certain amount of concentration, um, but that needs to be taken into consideration whether or not it is the correct amount, um, whether or not it's uniform, things like that. It's limited in its approach. Again, this is a starting point um, because there is really no standardization um, we're basically taking a bunch of bacteria, sticking some discs on it. Some discs might be stuck more than other discs. Um, maybe the agar's thicker in a particular area. Um, so there's a lot of room for error in this, um, but it, again, it's a good starting point. It doesn't really tell us whether it's bacteriostatic versus bactericidal, because when we plate this, we're putting bacteria all over the plate. We have not allowed it to grow up at all. We've just plated our initial inoculum and then we put the discs on there. So these could be actually killing bacteria in these zones here, um, or what it could be doing is the bacteria that was there, it's just completely halted its growth. And we, don't, we wouldn't know the difference. Also, we can't compare potencies or efficacies. So in this, um, in some ways we can a little bit, but it's not really great. So typically you can buy discs that have a certain amount or a certain um, concentration of the antimicrobial, but it only comes in a couple of different concentrations. And we have these big discs that we stick on there. Um, and we, we can't really tell what the efficacy is, meaning um, how well it's going to continue working. It's kind of a snapshot. So then we have the dilution tests. Um, so these are a little bit better in some ways. It allows for a direct comparison of potencies to determine the best therapeutic choice. So if we have then determined something from the Kirby Bauer disc diffusion assay, um, then we can move on to a dilution test. And what we can learn from the dilution test is our minimal inhibitory concentration, which we spoke about in the previous lecture, MIC. Um, I didn't go into detail, but it was mentioned. Um, the minimal inhibitory concentration, or MIC, is the lowest concentration of a particular antimicrobial that can inhibit bacterial growth, right? So stopping bacterial growth. And this is the minimum concentration. So it tells us kind of the lowest amount of a drug we can give somebody that's just going to halt the bacterial growth. Then we have the minimal bactericidal concentration, or MBC, which is going to give us the lowest concentration of an antimicrobial that's going to kill, that's why it's bactericidal, 99.9% um, or greater than that um, of the starting inoculum, so bactericidal. Uh, we can do this in two ways. We can do it a macro version, a larger version, or a micro version. Um, so in a macro broth dilution assay, uh, we have a dilution series. You can see it's a series, meaning there are different, um, different quantities or different concentrations, rather, uh, of micrograms per milliliter. And so we have the broth. We have the dilution series, meaning the different concentrations of the antimicrobial in the broth. And then we add the same amount of our cells, our bacterial cells, to the broth. We can determine the MIC, the minimum, minimum inhibitory concentration, by examining turbidity. So you can see here that in this case, we don't see a whole lot of cells. In this case, we do. So there's been some sort of growth here at the 4 um, and maybe not so much at the 8. So it tells us the lowest concentration that inhibits growth. <clears throat> Tubes with no visible growth, then, are plated to determine the MBC, bactericidal. So if we plate, for example, um, it's likely that they would have plated then the 8 
the 16 and the 32 to see how much growth there is on the plates um, after being incubated. Um, so there may still be growth here, but this would be our MIC, for example. And then if there's still growth here, say there's still growth when they plate this one, but let's say there's absolutely no growth at all over here, then this would give us our MBC, <clears throat> so our bactericidal level. So serum levels, right? So serum meaning in the bloodstream of an antibiotic should be three to five times above the MIC for treatment. So if somebody is in the hospital and they're providing treatment in the hospital because we're in a more serious situation, um, <clears throat> then they would be testing the blood, testing the serum to find out the level of that antimicrobial. And they would want to be maintaining that level of antimicrobial um, at three to five times the MIC in order to continue that treatment. So then the second way to do a dilution test, which is very common, is the micro dilution tray. So this is more common, particularly in areas like research laboratories and even in um, hospitals that need a, a quick response. They don't want to do these giant test tubes. Um, we can determine the MICs of multiple antimicrobial drugs or microorganisms in a single assay. Um, so basically all of these little, um, little spaces here are itty bitty teeny tiny test tubes um, on a giant plastic tray. And by giant, I actually mean like this is a note card size. Um, so note card meaning a big piece with these little tiny indents that act as test tubes. So it uses small volumes. Um, and an automated dispensing device. So you can come through, you can use a micro pipetter, a mechanical pipetter, and that has um, kind of a head on it like this. Um, so this is the, the pipetter up here with the plunger piece that you would put down. Um, <clears throat> and then the bottom, rather than just having one pipetter, um, would have multiple pipette tips. And then these multiple pi pipette tips, you would pick up um, the antimicrobial or the bacteria, very easily you would draw from all of these different concentrations and then, you know, pipette them out in all of these different areas. So um, it's much quicker, very small volumes, much quicker. And then typically these are placed inside of a spectrophotometer. And then the spectrophotometer, the machine itself, shines light through it in order to determine the turbidity, just like we saw with the macro dilution. Um, so it'll show turbidity, and then we can figure out the MIC very quickly. Then they can take this out, and given the information that the computer has given them, they can then take them and plate the particular ones that they need to to find out the MBC. And then lastly, we have the E-test. <clears throat> uh, the E-test is, as you can see, it's this strip here. Um, what we do, similar to the Kirby Bauer disc diffusion assay, is we create a lawn of bacteria on an agar plate. Then this plastic strip is placed on there. And this plastic strip, you can see the numbers on here. The numbers correspond to the concentration of that antimicrobial. Um, so you can see a very, very tiny amount down here all the way up to a much higher amount up here. So then we grow this with this on it, the, the actual strip on it. The lawn grows, the antibiotic is diffusing from the strip into the agar, and then the rate of diffusion is directly related to the concentration of the drug. Um, so we can see the different concentration, we can see an increased rate of diffusion with a higher concentration. And then the way we read this is the intersection of the elliptical zone and the strip indicates the MIC. So if we were to determine the MIC, we would say likely that the MIC is here, uh, because this is our minimum inhibitory concentration. So this is the smallest amount possible to stop the growth of the bacteria. Because you can see along here, there's seemingly lots and lots of growth. So we haven't stopped anything. Um, but you cannot determine the MBC. Because at this point, even up here, it might just be stopping the growth. And the, the antibiotic reached to this point. And this area just stopped the growth of the bacteria and didn't actually kill it. But maybe it ran out of nutrients, you know, it, it couldn't do anything, so it just was killed off eventually. It doesn't actually mean that the antimicrobial itself killed the bacteria. So um, some current strategies. We've got a lot of antibiotic resistance happening. Um, we want to try to get around that. So some different ways to get around that were 
trying to look at development of more semi-synthetic derivatives, so semi meaning partially synthetic. Um, we know that resistance develops rapidly, <clears throat> that pathogens are already resistant to our earlier generation of drugs in the same family. So trying to develop more in that same family, but by changing those R groups, like the beta lactams, for example, um, changing those R groups. It is easy uh, to mutate to develop resistance to new modifications, however. So if we do use the older models, like a beta lactam ring, and just attach more R groups, it might be easier for them to develop resistance to the, the new modification. Um, however, that's still a way that we're going. We're trying to figure out how we can do this. Um, the I chip is something that allows research to, researchers to investigate the antimicrobial producing capabilities of soil bacteria while it's in the soil, in situ. Um, and this has led to the discovery of Tyxobactin. This is from Mount Ararat in Turkey. In this case, this particular antimicrobial that has been discovered targets two steps in the gram-positive cell wall synthesis. Um, so we have not seen resistance to this yet. So going around and using this eye chip, um, which we can stick into the soil and then try to uh, determine some new antimicrobials is, is another way that we're going, another current strategy. Um, and then we also have looking into marine organisms. So, you know, that 70% of the earth is water. Um, we have already looked through a, a lot of soil to determine a lot of antimicrobials. Um, but as we saw, there's still a lot more to go, a lot more we can learn about soil bacteria. However, we have not spent much time in the water. Um, so looking into marine organisms and seeing what kind of antimicrobials they make and see if those, some of those would work for our common pathogens. Also combinatorial chemistry, so making large numbers of related compounds from simple precursors and then test those for antimicrobial activity. So basically making a whole bunch of different things all based on the kind of the same simple stuff, mi mixing and matching um, and seeing if any of those would work. So taking what we have and kind of mixing and matching and seeing if any of those would work better than what we already have. Also the development of compounds that inhibit resistance mechanisms to restore our old drug functions. So coming up with different chemicals, different antimicrobials to stop them from doing what they're doing to be resistant. So say we can shut down those efflux pumps. If we can go in, find something that can shut down the, the genes that make the efflux pump, then all of our old drugs that were affected by the efflux pump, pump um, could then be used again. Um, or, you know, Conversely, you know, any of the other ones, if we can go in and stop them from doing what they're doing, then our old drugs can be useful again. And then lastly, uh, develop inhibitors of virulence factor production and function. In this case, it wouldn't be bactericidal. So this is related to a video that I have shown in class um, that's related to quorum sensing, where these bacteria, they use these molecules um, within their own species, but then they also use molecules to communicate to other bacterial species, and they're looking at using that information, noting the, the actual molecules, the shape of the molecules that they use to communicate within the species, and the type of molecules, the shape of the molecules that they use to communicate outside of their species, but with other bacteria, and using those to make antimicrobials. And basically, um, a way to communicate to the bacteria, like, hey, there's not enough of us here to become virulent, so let's not be virulent, you know, even if there is. We're just using the drug to do this artificially. Um, and so then they wouldn't actually start to become virulent, and our immune system could wipe them out before they become virulent. So uh, that's another direction or another current strategy that we're using to try to get around this antimicrobial resistance or this drug resistance. <clears throat> 